This is CBC Here and Now. We are not asking for a handout. We are asking for fairness. Oil revenues have plummeted. The province looks to Ottawa for bailouts. The government releases its fiscal update. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Peter Cowan, and we are going to start tonight with the province's finances. The finance minister laid out a bleak picture. Thanks to low oil prices, snowmageddon, and now COVID-19, we're bleeding red ink. The fiscal year that ended March 31st saw revenues almost $700 million lower than expected a year ago. That's thanks to lower oil royalties and lower provincial tax revenue. Excluding the one-time Atlantic Accord revenues, last year's deficit was $1.1 billion. And a warning, the finances are only going to get worse this year. Oil represents $1 billion in revenue for 2019-20. We anticipate we'll be lucky if we see half of that this year. With oil revenues down even more this year, how are we going to get out of it? Now, the finance minister made it clear that he's going to have to go ha cap in hand asking Ottawa for money. We can't cut and tax our way out of this as this would have a devastating effect on the people of the province and on our prospects for economic recovery. We also have to deal with rate mitigation and the impacts of COVID-19 and the Muskrat Falls project. These challenges highlight the need to work on collaborative solutions as well as working with the federal government. We are not asking for a handout. We are asking for fairness. The opposition party and the NDP say they're willing to work with government to find solutions to these financial challenges if the government opens the books and lets them see how bad things really are. What we're saying to the government is, if you want collaboration on the colossal economic and financial issues we are now facing, and they admit we're facing, you've got to open the books. We'll help you. We'll collaborate with you to fix the problem. But we've got to know the scope of it and where the, where the source of the problems is. Then we'll help. I mean, we are in a very dire situation. You remember now that the report that we got today was only reflecting the last two weeks of March which was the very first of the pandemic. And I'll point out that the Premier wrote the Prime Minister before the pandemic about our dire fiscal situation. So it has only uh, degraded since there. A number of other provinces are also going to the federal government for help. Anthony joins me now with more on this. Anthony? Well, Peter, that's certainly true. Before COVID-19, Newfoundland and Labrador was in its own uh, unfortunate league as far as economic help was uh, required. Now, after COVID, that picture has changed. One person uh, who studies the economic situation of all the provinces is Pedro Antunes. He's the uh, chief economist with the Conference Board of Canada, and he joins us from Ottawa. So, Mr. Antunes, what's your assessment of where Newfoundland and Labrador is right now as far as its economics go? Well, I mean, I think it's important to understand that uh, Newfoundland Labrador's economy has been pretty healthy over the last uh, over the last number of years. Uh, of course, with the reduction in oil prices back in 2015, this has caused a lot of uh, a lot of stress, especially on on the revenue side, and it's uh, caused a lot of stress on the fiscal side as well. Uh, and uh, in the in in those years since 2015, essentially, uh, we have seen uh, that play itself out on uh, the local economy. Uh, we know that uh, with the fiscal restraint that's been in place, higher taxes, that's taken a toll as well on the local economy. And uh, of course, uh, now we're hit with a double whammy of not only already low oil prices, uh, but the situation with respect to COVID-19 shutting down the domestic economy in Newfoundland Labrador, much like it has in pretty much every economy in the world. Uh, but on top of that, we've seen uh, oil prices really collapse from where they were uh, just a year ago. Uh, and of course, that that's a double whammy for Newfoundland Labrador, because again, we're, we're getting that hit on the revenue side uh, on, the, uh, on the revenue side for, for oil producers, but also uh, on the government side as well. 
So obviously a very uh, serious situation, uh, and none of this factors in how difficult uh, April and May were. What's your sense of uh, how the next fiscal year is going to play out for this province? Well, this is uh, the situation. I mean, we're seeing already, uh, uh, I mean, it was a bit surprising to, uh, from the economic update that we saw today, to see how deep the uh, own source revenue cuts uh, were uh, with essentially just a few weeks of shutdown with respect to COVID-19 in March. Uh, I know there was other problems that the economy suffered in terms of uh, the big winter storm that uh, that uh, uh, occurred this year, et cetera. Um, but uh, with respect to all of that, even accounting for all of that, it was surprising as to how deep the uh, the revenue side, uh, own source revenues were. Now, on top of that, there's going to be a much deeper cut in royalty revenues for next year because we're going to have a full year, we think, uh, next th this, this fiscal that we're in right now, uh, where oil prices are going to be low because essentially of what's happening to global demand. Uh, so that's going to take... You know, we figure probably uh, uh, around 700 million out of what was originally projected out of revenues from uh, just the royalty side. Um, so the point is that if you really look, uh, aside from the Atlantic Accord, Newfoundland Labrador is essentially running a billion dollar deficit, uh, so more or less in that ballpark for, for this past fiscal. Uh, we think that's going to be worse next fiscal. So it, it is problematic in terms of the province's ability to to, to, to essentially um, uh, put out debt to pay for, for this, this spending. Now, obviously, the, like other provinces, this one is uh, banking, I, I say, on the federal government coming to, to our rescue to some degree. Is there any hope that you see anything to, to sort of give some people some optimism? I mean, obviously, we've got a big problem to get out of, but any bright lights? Uh, well, I do try, I try and, uh, uh, for example, I, I do think that uh, the social distancing measures and the, the uh, shutdown of the economy will be, uh, will hopefully see the worst of that in April. I, I think the bright, uh, the, the kind of uh, silver lining on this kind of dark cloud is that we are emerging from the, uh, 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 from the worst of this uh, recession and we're hopeful that the second and third quarter will be, will be better. Excuse me the second half of the year will be better. Um, I, I, I do think the, the problem is big, but the province can do its own. I, if, they, if we do keep see the, provinces, uh, the province keeping to spending reduction targets, I think that'll set uh, a precedent and, and, uh, and show that the province is, uh, is really working right. towards fixing its fiscal situation. All right, uh, Pedro uh, Antunes, thank you very much for your insight in this. You mentioned a dark cloud. It's certainly cloudy and rainy out here, so I thank you for your time. Uh, you're most welcome. I appreciate you calling. Meanwhile, some government employees will be going back to work next week. The finance minister said today about 20% of civil servants will be back to their workplace. Osborne said the people with the highest level of productivity at home will likely stay at home the longest. Well, with so much dependent on the price of oil, a bit of good news for the sector today. The federal government announced a change that it hopes will speed up exploration. A new regulatory change means environmental assessments for exploratory drilling in Newfoundland and Labrador's offshore areas will take less time. But the province's federal representative in cabinet says it doesn't mean impact assessments will be any less comprehensive. From business and investors in this, in this industry, this has been the number one thing the government of Canada has been asked for for years. It provides faster timelines for exploration on the offshore of this province. From up to 905 days under the previous CA 2012 legislation to as little as 90 days. To Labrador now, where members of the Innu Nation are calling for a long-awaited inquiry into children and care to finally get underway. The renewed calls for action come after an Innu teenager took his own life. The 15-year-old was originally from the community of Natwashish, but had been living in a group home in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Here are now's Chris O'Neill Yates reports. I spoke with the Innu Nation Grand Chief Gregory Rich, and he says that Natwishi, Sheshishi, both Inu communities are completely shocked, devastated, shaken by the death of a 15-year-old boy who was living in a group home in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The boy was from Natwishish. 
He says what's different in this community, you know, that has seen a fair number of suicides, unfortunately, is that the boy was actually living in a place that was run by the child protection system. So it wasn't a child that went home and died by his own hand. This child was actually living in a center run by child protection, and that raises a lot of questions for them. The other concern because of this death is the reaction of other children in the community. He says many of them now are going on social media, talking among themselves and expressing ideas like taking their own lives. This sort of thing he said happened last fall as well when a young woman from one of their communities died by her own hand and it was so devastating for young people that they started expressing these thoughts themselves. And he says parents are really worried for their children right now. They're offering counseling, the Inu Nation is, as much as they can, but he says unfortunately it's, it's not enough, that they need more help. We need to change the system because I've said a lot um, in the past, this is a broken system and it's not working for the Inu, people, Inu youth in, our, in both communities. And, 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 and you know, I've stressed out all, many times, we have ideas how this would work. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, it's, it's not moving forward, you know? And they don't want to implement our, our, our ideas. And if that continues to, uh, to happen, we'll, we'll have more of these incidents happening. Chief Rich says all of this goes back to the need and the desire to have an inquiry looking into Inu children's dealings with the child protection system. They had been for a long time lobbying to get an inquiry, and in 2017, the province did agree to hold one. There was a bit of a, a time that went by there that nothing seemed to be happening until Ottawa came on board. Ottawa came on board in 2018. Here we are in 2020, and he says the inquiry still hasn't happened. I contacted the province who says they're moving forward. They're looking to establishing a commissioner and a panel of people to conduct this inquiry and that they expect it to happen in 2020, but they didn't give any date. As far as the Inu Nation is concerned, this inquiry should be underway already before another child in their community dies by their own hand. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. We can report tonight about growing unrest inside the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, and Chief Joe Boland is at the centre of it. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. It appears a rebellion is underway against RNC Chief Joe Bolin, and it's being led by an association that represents nearly 400 of his officers. And ironically, it's the very same police association that Joe Bolin used to lead. CBC News has obtained a leaked copy of an email from the RNC Association to constables, sergeants and staff sergeants. It reveals details of what it's calling a vote of non-confidence against Chief Bolin prompted by what it says are ongoing concerns raised by association members. Officers are being asked to vote, beginning today, on whether they have confidence in the chief. They have until June 25th to vote. Association President Sergeant Mike Summers declined to comment today. But the email says the vote will be anonymous and every officer is being encouraged to participate. A vote of non-confidence would not automatically result in Boland's removal, but the association said it would use the results to further advocate on behalf of its members. Bolin was appointed chief in July 2017. There have been rumblings about discontent on the force and results of a 2019 job satisfaction survey obtained by CBC News appear to suggest that is the case, with most officers saying they feared retribution if they initiated a grievance or complaint. In January, Bolin confirmed that a uniformed member of the force leveled a harassment allegation against him. And Bolin has also been accused of bias by Constable Joe Smythe, who is at the center of an internal disciplinary hearing. Chief Bolin was unavailable for comment today, but I was able to connect with Justice Minister Andrew Parsons. He told me he was unaware of this vote of non-confidence and as such said he couldn't comment. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. People in Beta Spare are sounding the alarm about medical services in their area. The clinic there has stopped providing emergency services because there are no doctors. The alternative? Drive an hour and a half away. Well, tonight, people in the community are coming together to express their concerns. We have a lot of seniors in our area. 
um, you know, a lot of people with um, different health issues, same as in any other community. Um, but we have been suffering for years with no um, no doctor, you know, no stable doctor. So our primary health care has been suffering for years. And therefore, a lot of us, are, our health care has gone by the wayside. And we do have chronic conditions and acute conditions and, and whatever. Well, the food fishery is going to go ahead this year, and it's going to look very similar to last year. The federal government announced today that you'll be able to go out on for fishing on Saturdays, Sundays, and Mondays throughout July and August, as well as the last week in September. The limits remain the same as well. You can catch up to five fish each to a maximum of 15 per boat. Well, it's shaping up to be a nice start to the weekend. However, there is some rain in the forecast as we head towards Saturday and into Sunday. I'll have all those details coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Spring and summer typically means more time outside, and for many this year, it'll mean more time around the house. CBC NL teamed up with the folks at the St. John's Tool Library 
for some tips on do-it-yourself projects you can tackle right now. Tonight, we're starting with the backyard. Hi, I'm Jonas Roberts with the St. John's Tool Library, and today I'll be teaching you how to make a quick, simple, and effective raised bed. There's a few advantages to gardening in a raised bed. They warm up quicker in the spring, they have excellent drainage, and the soil doesn't compact as much as if you were growing in the ground. All you'll need for this project is two pieces of 10 foot, two by 10 boards, and about a dozen three inch screws. You also need some tools, including a saw, a drill, a straight edge, a tape measure and a pencil, as well as some safety equipment, including safety glasses and work gloves. And if you don't have any of these tools yourself, you can get them all at the St. John's Tool Library. So with all of this, you'll be able to make a three foot by seven foot raised bed in probably under half an hour. Safety glasses and work gloves are always a good idea. Always make sure that your work area is clean and any tripping hazards are removed. And since you'll be working with very long boards, make sure that there's nothing around that you could accidentally knock over. Okay, first step is to measure the full length of each board just to make sure they are 10 feet. Sometimes they're slightly off and it's good to know what you're dealing with before you start. Next, you want to measure three feet from the end of each board. Make your mark with a pencil. Next, take a straight edge to mark the line that you're going to cut. And remember, measure twice, cut once. Next, cut the three foot lengths off the end of each board. You can use uh, any type of power saw for this, but I prefer a handsaw. Next, we're gonna drill three pilot holes so when you put your screws in, it won't split the ends of the wood. Next, put your boards in place just to make sure that it looks how you think it's going to look and that both sides are the same length. I suggest putting the three foot boards on the inside of the seven foot board so you have a little bit more growing space. Next, you're going to drill in your screws to attach the sides of the bed. And that's it. So now what you wanna do is place your bed in a nice sunny location that's sheltered from the wind and you're going to fill it with good quality soil. I recommend a high quality triple mix, but if you're going to use topsoil, then make sure you dig in lots, <laughs> make sure you dig in lots of rich compost. Fill it right to the top because the soil is going to compact over the summer. The St. John's Tool Library is actually selling kits for these beds. I uh, will deliver right to your door. It includes the pre-cut wood, the pre-drilled pilot holes, and all the screws and wood that you need. All you need to assemble it would be a screwdriver. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is midnight, Friday, May 15th. Order tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. A nice day to stay inside, certainly uh, for eastern areas of the island. A little bit chilly as well. I struggled with whether to turn my heat on or not today, but decided against that. That's what sweaters are for. Let's take a look at those temperatures across the board. Only reaching a high near 14 degrees uh, for St. John's. And then we've got temperatures uh, significantly warmer as you head towards the coast. 21 degrees in Corner Brook today, 15 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then Lab City. You're still sitting in that cooler air. You reached a high near 4 degrees today. Now that area of low pressure is to the north. We are still seeing that snow mixed with rain for areas in Lab West. And as far as that rain goes for eastern areas of the island, because we don't have the radar uh, this summer, have to figure out where that rain is by using satellites and water vapor. So at this point, it looks like the most of the precipitation, at least the heaviest rain, has moved offshore. But we are uh, starting to see some clearing skies along the west coast. And that'll generally be the trend as we head through the evening tonight across the board. So some scattered showers for central areas, that'll move off. And then we're still looking at some fog patches developing overnight. Then another round of showers will potentially move through for the west coast. And the winds will eventually ease for eastern areas of the island as well. Otherwise, we're going to hang on to that potential for some showers or flurries for areas of uh, Labrador, at least the western portions of Labrador. Through the day tomorrow, it actually looks like a pretty lovely day for most of us. We could see a few showers develop in the afternoon through central. This may even uh, strike. We may even see a few lightning strikes with that as well. But overall, a pretty lovely day, which is some scattered showers making their way across the big land and then eventually 
towards uh, the rest of the west coast and then through central as you head through the overnight. So temperatures tomorrow I have a little bit warmer, about 21 degrees in St. John's. Those winds will be out of the south about 20 kilometers per hour. Stronger winds for the west coast, southwesterly is gusting upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. And then again, keeping that potential for showers in along the west coast in the morning, and then you should see some clearing. And then 13 degrees again for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Lab City, you're gonna sit around the six degree mark. Now temperatures will eventually climb slowly, about eight degrees for you by the time Saturday rolls around. And then temperatures hovering around anywhere from 18 to 21 degrees in the east. And then along the south coast, you're still looking at some of those cooler temperatures. But Saturday does look like we'll see some showers in the morning, some sunshine, in the afternoon and then those shower potential will move back in through the day. Now Sunday's looking wet and those temperatures drop back down to the teens into Monday and then continuing through Tuesday but we should see some clearing skies at this point. For central and western Newfoundland generally gray maybe a few peaks of sun for you in central but then we drop down in those temperatures by the time uh, next week rolls around looks like the western area of the island will stay a little bit mild in 16 degrees and then for eastern and western labrador you're pretty much looking at anywhere from single digits to double digits and basically some sunshine uh, for you in eastern labrador as you head into the week now just wanted to share this great shot of a misty day on the east coast trail jackie burke sent us that shot if you have any weather photos to share with us send them to nl photo at cbc.ca. Wow, looks like a nice hike.
Just a reminder before we go tonight that Here and Now is returning to an hour-long program starting in just over a week, Monday, June 15th. We do want to thank you for all the calls and emails, and we look forward to expanding our program back to 60 Minutes. And we are going to leave you tonight with some shots of a new ship headed into St. John's Harbor today. This is the MV Calvert. It's a new state-of-the-art vessel for Ocean Choice International. OCI says the Calvert is one of the most modern ground fish vessels in the country. And today it arrived into the port. Not exactly the best day for it. Although uh, Ashley has assured us some nicer weather coming up for at least part of the weekend. And that's it for Here and Now for your Thursday. I'm Peter Cowan. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.